uh, the personnel there really look out for everybody, yeah. including those whose family never stepped foot on the place. Yeah. They still took just as yeah. good a care of them as they did of somebody like me that was always there. And uh, but I've noticed in other rest homes to the people that's workers there, the patients don't mean anything to them. It's just a paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I started my career in a convalescent hospital, and I remember it was an African-American woman that died. I'd been there for about a year and a half, and uh, after she died, all these families, we never knew she had family. Yeah. It was so sad. It is. Folks, I'm going to bid you a... Uh, uh... Farewell. I'm I'm actually very tired. It's been a it's been a hectic day. I was supposed to have Sabbath. I wasn't supposed to clean drains, but um, yeah, and try and catch the dog. <laughs> Pray for me, please. Um, Dave, I'm, I'll I'll watch your your sermon tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, I'm going to be watching it. Thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you so much. I'll chat to you guys. Have a wonderful Sabbath and a wonderful week forward. Chat to Buenas you noches. Thank you. Buenas noches, my friend. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <clears throat>
But Paula begins to witness strange things like a picture disappears and a brooch goes missing and, and the gas lights are dimming. And her husband convinced her that the incidents are either caused by her or they never happen. So he uses Paula's supposed mental issues to justify his efforts to further sequester her in the house. In the end, we learn he had murdered Paula's aunt and developed an elaborate plan to discredit Paula to her own mind so he could freely search the house for her aunt's jewels. And here's the definition of gaslighting. <clears throat> it's the systematic attempt by one person to erode another person's reality by telling them that they are experiencing what they're experiencing is a so, and the gradual giving up on the part of the other person. So how does it work? Well, gaslighting is a form of emotional and psychological abuse designed to gain control over the victim. And it has three main components. First, you convince the victim that the abuse they suffer is their fault. Second, you convince the victim that they did not experience what they think they did. And now, we want to separate the victim from people who support them. The tone of the victimizer can alternate between concerned, kind, and angry and abusive. <clears throat> so the victim slowly learns to mistrust their own judgment, perception, and even sanity until they rely on the abuser to divine reality for them. And uh, <clears throat> so this is how the, the media manipulates and brainwashes people by saying that that's fake news. Don't listen to anyone but me. And let me say this. I'm not siding with the right wing, the left wing, radical voices out there. I'm a Christian first and foremost, and will avoid talking politics at all costs. <clears throat> this is from Council to Churches. Sister White said, God's children are to separate themselves from politics, from any alliance with unbelievers. Do not take part in political strife separate from the world and refrain from bringing into the church or school ideas that will lead to uh, contention and disorder. <clears throat> so back to our topic, gaslighting. In my opinion, it all started in heaven. After all, who convinced a third of the angels that God was not fair? His rules were arbitrary and he should have the honor given to Christ. Well, that was looser, of course. And who approached Eve when she was alone in the garden, separated from her mate? Genesis 2, chapter 2, verse 15, 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat it of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Well, here comes trouble. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. So, in fact, gaslighting was utilized in the first temptation mentioned in the Bible. Satan first pr prompts Eve to question what she heard God say about the tree of knowledge, and then he asserts that her account is wrong. That is gaslighting, as he caused Eve to doubt the reality of what she knew to be true. So we read on. <clears throat> now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the tree, fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Well, <clears throat> did you always say don't touch it? No, the serpent has her confused now, doesn't he? <clears throat> and the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That's an outright lie. And where's her mate? Fad counsel. So the deeds of seeds of doubt have been planted. What do you believe? Well, aren't we always eager to learn? Watch Satan gaslight our parents by appealing to the human pride and vanity. He says, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. While well, Eve had wandered near the forbidden tree, and her curiosity was aroused to know how death could be concealed in the fruit of this fair tree. She was surprised to hear her queries taken up and repeated by a strange voice. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? 
Eve was not aware that she had revealed her thoughts and audibly conversing with herself. Therefore, she was greatly astonished to hear her queries repeated by a serpent. She thought the serpent had a knowledge of her thoughts and that he must be very wise. <clears throat> Later, we, we'll see the result of relying on highly educated people for spiritual guidance. You'll see. Christ was put to the closest test, requiring the strength of all his faculties to resist inclination, when in danger to use his power to deliver himself from peril and triumph over the power of the prince of darkness. Satan showed his knowledge of the weak points of the human heart and put forth his utmost power to take advantage of the weakness of the humanity, which Christ had assumed in order to overcome his temptations on man's account. That's when he was tempted in the desert. Now, God has given man precious promises on conditions of faith and obedience, but they are not to sustain him in any rash act. If men needlessly place themselves in peril and go where God does not require them to go and self-confidently expose themselves to danger, disregarding the dictates of reason, God will not work a miracle to relieve them. He will not send his angels to preserve any from being burned if they choose to place themselves in the fire. And, you know, we tell our children, don't touch it, it's hot. But sometimes they have to find out for themselves, don't they? Now, Adam was not deceived by the serpent, as was Eve. It was inexcusable in Adam to rashly transgress God's poverty command. Adam was presumptuous because his wife had sinned. He could not see what would become of Eve. He was sad, troubled, and tempted. He listened to Eve's recital of the words of the serpent. And his constancy and integrity began to waver. Doubts arose in his mind in regard to whether God did mean just what he said. He rashly ate the tempting fruit. So that's gaslighting. See how it works? You plant the seed and one person is all it takes to cast doubt and start to question, what is reality? Can I believe what I see or is it just my imagination? We have to be careful, folks, because we need to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion of walking about, seeking whom he may, he may devour. He is on the playground, watching your amusements and catching every soul whom he finds off guard, sowing his seeds in human hearts and gaining control of human minds. Not all gaslighters are aware of what they're doing. Some have so deceived themselves, they actually believe the lies they're ter telling. Others are so afraid of the truth that they'll do anything they can to hide it. Kids often have no problem gaslighting their parents, falsely claiming, well, mom never told me to do the dishes, for example. Now, uh, I sent my son to his room one time for timeout. So I was going to go 10 minutes later, let him out. And this is what I found. And I said, what happened? And he goes, oh, the, the piglets crawled in the window and messed up my room. Really? So I told him, well, next time the piglets come in and mess up this room like this, I'm going to spank you and the piglets. So God, God made us enter to dependent on others in the church, but he did not make us to abandon all reason and rely solely on another's judgment. God wants us to live in the truth. And we're in Psalms 25, we're told, guide me in your truth and teach me for you are God, my savior. And my hope is in you all day long. And where do we find truth? Well, we pray and study. Don't rely on me or a TV preacher for your salvation. Only you can claim the prize. <clears throat> and Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. So you have to remember to avoid questionable sources when you study. And you'll see an example here later. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Think for yourself. Don't trust the world. <clears throat> for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, sometimes one person does remember something differently than another. It happens to everyone. But in resolving a misunderstanding or misremembering, the goal shouldn't be to prove who's right or who's wrong. It should be showing respect 
and seeking mutual understanding. Now, a gaslighter, he manipulates the truth to their benefit, he controls the information, and misdirects the victim into submission. Now, that, there's a place where gaslighting is common. That's in churches and religious communities. Survivors of spiritual abuse later realized they stayed in the abusive group for so long because they've been taught not to question the church leadership. Questioning the church leadership was questioning God's decision to put those leaders in charge. But that is gross misinterpretation of, of Hebrews 13, 7. And, or, and Paul said, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy, but not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. So remember the, uh, the uh, Heaven's Gate people? that committed suicide because Haley's comma was coming to take them. Well, yeah, that's when you listen to your leader, that's what can happen. And James Jones in Ghana, uh, they all drank the Kool-Aid. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We're born with two ears and one mouth, so let's use them appropriately. <clears throat> and here again is a definition. Gaslighting is the deliberate, malicious, and manipulative practice to deflect attention away from oneself back onto the other person, blaming them in order to instill self-doubt, question their own memory, perception of reality, and in the process, their own safety, security, and sanity in their own environment. <clears throat> so gaslighting is a form of manipulation in which your reality or your experience is system, systematically and intentionally invalidated. It's when someone uses lies and deception in order to manipulate you. Someone who gaslight constantly questions your word or your perception of reality. Now, what brought on this study <clears throat> was Heinz's comments about the attack on Ellen G. White by Leroy Froome and others. And, and we can see in the news how evil leaders control information to fit their agenda. And here's what she said. I should be an unfaithful watchman were I to hold my peace when I see the very foundations of our faith being torn away by those who have departed from the faith and who are now adrift without an anchor. In this time when false doctrines are being taught, we are to teach the same truth that we have taught for the past half century. I have not changed my faith one jot or one tittle. <clears throat> and you're going to hear rumors that Later on, uh, uh, Sister White became a Trinitarian, that she ate pork, she went to movies, and she wore jewelry, and on and on and on. <clears throat> just lies, just gaslighting. That's what it is. For there are certain men crept in unawares <clears throat> who were before of old ordained in this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Alpha of Heresies had already entered our church in the days of Ellen White through John Harvey Kellogg, but the Omega of Heresies was to follow, and Sister White warned that it would be of a most startling nature. Be not deceived, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the Alpha of this danger. The Omega will be of a most startling nature. And she went on to say, I am instructed to speak plainly. Meet it is the word spoken to me. Meet it firmly and without delay. But it is not to be met by our taking our working forces from the field to investigate doctrines and points of difference. We have no such investigation to make. In the book, Living Temple, there is presented the alpha of deadly heresies. The omega will follow and will be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning God has given. And she said, I tell you now that when I am laid to rest, great changes will take place. I want the people to know that I warned them fully before my death. Well, <clears throat> here comes the Omega of Apostate. Now that all the pioneers have been laid to rest, we have Leroy Froome. I was compelled to search out a score of valuable books written by men outside of our faith for initial clues and suggestions. Having these, I went on from there. But they were decided early helps. 
and scores, if not hundreds, could confirm the same sobering condition. Some of these other men frequently had a deeper insight into the spiritual things of God than many of our own men had on the Holy Spirit in the triumphal life. It was still a largely obs obscured theme. <clears throat> Even has the audacity to say that the men of Babylon had a deeper insight into spiritual things of God than many of our pioneers. <clears throat> and look at his accomplices, <clears throat> A.G. Daniels, Prescott, Wilcox, and on and on. So our pioneers, Sister White confirmed, searched for truth as for hidden treasure and moved step by step under the influence of the Spirit of God. Now, there's only one God. Christianity emerged from the ancient Hebrews, and the Decalogue begins with that divine statement. Let me back up. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The New Testament continues Old Testament truths. When then caused these, or oh, what caused these monotheistic Jews and Christians to declare belief in a three person Godhead? Well, <clears throat> Non-Trinitarian faith groups reject the Trinity. The doctrine itself was first introduced by Tertullian at the end of the second century, but it wasn't widely accepted until the fourth or fifth centuries. Hmm. And here's some of the rationale for the Trinity. This is what some people say. Uh, oops, what happened? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> they say because God refers to himself both as he and us. In the Old Testament, the plural form of one of the nouns for God is Elohim. It's quantitative. Let us make man in our image. The plural appears both with the verb let us make and the possessive suffix our. Now, <clears throat> the word quantitative just means how many. It could be one to affinity. There's no specifically three. And here's the problem English and Hebrew don't always translate well. First, Yahweh is a proper noun, the personal name of Israel's deity. And second, Elohim is a common noun used to refer to deity, but it could be even pagan gods. Okay. <clears throat> now, Genesis 1 1 states, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here, the word for God is Elohim, having a plural form as though it meant gods. Trinitarians maintain that this is proof that God is a plurality careful investigation of the actual use of the word in the Jewish scriptures unequivocally shows that Elohim, while plural, plural in form, is singular in concept. So we can't apply rules of English grammar to Hebrew to justify a Trinity doctrine. Matthew Henry says, man was not made in the likeness of any creature that went before him but in the likeness of his creator, yet still between God and man, there's an infinite distance. Christ only is the express image of God's person. As the son of his father, having the same nature, it is only some of God's honor that is put upon man, who is God's image only as the shadow in the glass or the king's impress on a coin. <clears throat> now here's another example of misapplied grammar. Because of the Great Commission, new disciples are baptized in the singular name of the three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <clears throat> well, now, wait a minute. What does and mean? And indicates more than one. <clears throat> so let me, <clears throat> let me try an analogy here. You go to the market and you buy some bananas and lentils and sunflower seeds or whatever <clears throat> now was that a bag of groceries yeah that's three in one but anything in the grocery bag could be exchanged for another product and still be groceries right yeah apple coconut milk and uh ezekiel bread that's groceries so you see the logic that their logic doesn't just work for me first corinthians eight six but to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. <clears throat> now, James tells us 
Thou believest that there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. <clears throat> and, and here's more proof, their proof of Trinity. <clears throat> I believe it was uh, March 2011. Oh, no, I've missed a one here. <clears throat> By the grace of Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. <clears throat> now, this is uh, from March 2011. From the Adventist Review. <clears throat> Careful reflections on the triune God can come only from a heart and mind trained in humility. Scripture must be the primary source of our knowledge of him. Christians manifest their avowed dependence upon the, his, this book, which contains many affirmations of the deity of the three divine persons. The historic formulation of the Trinity seeks to circumscribe and safeguard this mystery, not explain it. That is beyond us. And it confronts us with perhaps the most difficult thought that the human mind has ever been asked to handle. It is not easy, but it's true. Hmm. Well, who decides what's true? Yeah. So. <clears throat> well, oh, here we go. While no scriptural passage states formally the doctrine of uh, the Trinity, it is assumed as a fact by Bible writers and mentioned several times. Well, assumed, huh, what happened to proof? Here we go. Many doctrines are accepted by evangelicals as being clearly taught in the scripture for which there's no proof text. The doctrine of the Trinity furnishes the best example of this. It is fair to say <clears throat> that the Bible does not clearly teach the doctrine of the Trinity. In fact, is not, there is not even one proof text. <clears throat> if by proof text we mean a verse or passage that clearly states there is one God who exists in three persons. Hmm. As a church, do we still adhere to the sola scriptura? Doesn't look that way from what we read, read earlier. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> this is from a Catholic magazine. Our opponents sometimes claim that no belief should be held dogmatically, which is not explicitly stated in scripture. But the Protestant churches have themselves accepted such dogmas as the Trinity, for which there is no precise authority in the Gospels. Hmm. And the Catholic Church states the mystery of the Trinity is the central doctrine of the Catholic faith upon our, all other teachings of the church. And here's a, <clears throat> a J. and Andrews. The doctrine of the Trinity, which was established in the church by the Council of Nice, AD 325. This doctrine destroys the personality of God and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The infamous measures by which it was forced upon the church, which appear upon the pages of ecclesiastical history, might well cause every believer in that doctrine to blush. Well, you think J.N. Andrews would be blushing today if he knew the school named after him teaches this doctrine? Well, Ellen White knew the heresies would come in regarding the personality of God and warned us to study. <clears throat> the 17th chapter of John speaks plainly regarding the personality of God and of Christ and of their relation to each other. <clears throat> She also wrote a chapter in Ministry of Healing called A True Knowledge of God, in which she states at the end, this is the knowledge which God is inviting us to receive and beside which all else is vanity and nothingness. So please study these chapters for yourself and see if you can find a Trinity. The entire gospel and plan of salvation are distorted by the Trinity doctrine. <coughs> Isaiah 32, 6, for the vile person will speak villainy and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy and to utter error against the Lord, to make empty the soul of the hungry, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. So he's using gaslighting. He wants us to lose faith and ignore Yahweh's instruction. <clears throat> In Galatians, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. 
so gaslighting is a specific tactic designed to make people doubt themselves and thus grooming them to believe the other person's views and perceptions. It is something that leaders of any kind might use to their advantage to control uh, a, a group of people. If people can't trust themselves, they will be far more likely to start trusting their leader, which is the intended goal. Cults use this as well. Messages to the members to not trust themselves nor the outside world make it easier to keep them in the fold. You know what? You'd be amazed at some of the profound philosophy found in public bathrooms. Not that I spend a lot of time there anymore, but I'll never forget. I think it was in Berkeley, California, back in the 1960s. Someone had written in bold letters on the bathroom door, God is dead, Nietzsche. Wow. That's a shocking statement for believers. First thought, well, could it be true? Well, here's the irony. In rebuttal, an even more profound statement. Nietzsche is dead. God. <laughs> so, you see, <laughs> Nietzsche was, he didn't believe in God. And since he didn't believe in God, that he had once existed, how could he be dead, right? Well, <clears throat> what, what he really believed was that the Western world's foundation for morality had been destroyed. It's just that the people in the West hadn't realized it yet. So the madman who tried to make them realize it, it came too early. He had no idea of the things to come. <clears throat> and I was listening to Sean Boonstra in his talk show about a book written by Christopher Hitchens called God is Not Great. So, and he says, in God is Not Great, it, it, the book is a violent, irrational, and intolerant allied to racism and tribalism and bigotry, invested in ignorance and a hostile to free in inquiry, guilty of misogyny, child abuse, and fraud on a monumental scale. So he's gaslighting or casting doubt, making the creator look bad. He's only focusing on the negative and missing the lessons the scriptures were originally recorded for our instruction and our well-being. And look at the example of rebuilding the wall <clears throat> in Jerusalem. But the, the <clears throat> excuse me, the restoration of defense in Jerusalem did not go forward un, unhindered. <clears throat> Satan was working to stir up, excuse me, again, <clears throat> opposition and bring discouragement. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, this principal agents in this movement, now set themselves to hinder the work of rebuilding. Well, how? They endeavored to cause division among the workers. <clears throat> they ridiculed the efforts of the builders, declaring the enterprise impossibility. <clears throat> and, and they said, what, did, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, which are burned? Tobias, still more contemptuous, added, even that which they built, fox go up, shall even break down their stone wall. That isn't very encouraging, is it? It's gaslighting, cast doubt, make the test seem hopeless and a waste of time. That's Satan's plan for all of us. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the report was spread too that Nehemiah was plotting against the Persian monarch, intending to exalt himself as king over Israel, and that all who aided him were traitors. Hmm. Now resort to lies, even if they have been proven wrong. Now, how can we combat gaslighting? Uh, because in Philippians, we're told that nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in glowing let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. <clears throat> so how can we overcome Someone trying to lead us astray. Go from the presence of a fo foolish man when thou perceiveth not in his lips of knowledge. Do not speak to fools, for they will scorn your prudent words. Don't, re <clears throat> don't respond to the stupidity of a fool. You'll only look foolish yourself. Answer a fool in simple terms so he doesn't get a swelled head. Because you're not going to win a war of words. Instead, limit your communication to the necessary facts. Resist attempts to explain or get them to understand you. Actions speak better than words. 
<clears throat> I know <clears throat> we're passing out literature in, in Pixley one time and I uh, pastor of another denomination. Uh, I handed him the paper and he goes, oh, Seventh-day Adventist, huh? We're going to talk about the law? I don't know. You want to? He goes, you know, that law was nailed to the cross. And I just go, oh, really? So is murder okay now? Can I steal your car out here? Is that okay? Yeah, he just closed the door. So don't argue with people. It's not worth it. And make no mistake, a gaslighter is not doing this in order to help you or as an effort to arrive at a shared truth. Instead, they're questioning you in order to gain power over you. Their goal is not to help, is to make you feel crazy, weak, or dependent. A gaslighter wants something for you, and they use deceptive tactics to get it. <clears throat> Here's some more advice. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion, companion of fools shall be destroyed. It is God that shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah. And the Lord will do just what he has declared that he would. He will withdraw his blessings from the earth and remove his protecting care from those who are rebelling against his law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. <clears throat> Satan has control of all whom God does not especially guard. He will favor and prosper some in order to further his own designs. And he will bring trouble upon others and lead men to believe that it is God who is afflicting them. <clears throat> okay, who is the most, who is the ultimate gaslighter? And what is his goal? Satan wants you destroyed along with all of Yahweh's creation. Don't be led astray by some of these new ideas and opinions. Study, pray, trust what you see and what the Holy Spirit counsels. Trust your Savior and his word. We're told we must educate, educate, educate pleasantly and intelligently. We must preach the truth, pray the truth, live the truth, bringing it with its gracious, health-giving influences when, within the reach of those who know it not. So <clears throat> that's the message for today. Don't be discouraged, but listen or listen to naysayers. Keep fighting for our Savior because he's fighting for our salvation. Okay. Let me stop share. Okay, people. Sorry I couldn't uh, couldn't talk. The <laughs> allergies are getting to me. Dave, yeah. I want to I want to say that was so good. Uh, I never even knew what that term meant. I never heard that before. Well, that's why somebody asked me, and I just had a vague idea, but it's been going on forever. It's not new. Yeah. It's just a new word. Yeah. <laughs> you think about it. Uh, gaslighting is exactly what they used on stage for productions. For yeah. Fictional things. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so. Yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting once I got into it. I didn't want to get political with this, but it's going on right now. Yeah. You watch the news. You know, one side says one thing, one side says another, and I try to stay out of it. But, but yeah, we need to pray for our Christian brothers and sisters. Well, Dave, you never, you never see Jesus Christ praying to the Holy Spirit. No. Never did. And then when that says... Uh, God created us in our image. He was apparently talking to his son. Yeah. There's two of them. And we're going to make them in our image, not the angels, me, not the beast, <clears throat> not the cherubim. Yeah. Our <clears throat> image. It's well, who like, he's talking to there. Yeah, well, like I said, uh, Hebrew doesn't necessarily translate to English very well. Yeah. It's just like Spanish. Uh, uh, Abel can tell you sometimes. Uh, preaching in Spanish from a King James Bible, it's, it's hard, isn't it, Abel? You're muted. Yes, it is. That's <laughs> like come, I haven't done it. Yeah, because <laughs> how many Hispanic people are named Jesus? Yes. <laughs> well, no, when I took, when I took Spanish it's in Seuss. high school, yeah. when you have a name that ends in an A, it's female. When it ends in an O, it's male. Yeah. You don't have that so much in the English language. No. Um, because there's some, like a guy I know, Marion, 
you know, there's females and males. Uh -huh. And so many times down through the ages, a word changes its meaning altogether because like my mother's generation growing up used one word for something. My generation used another word for the same thing. And now this generation uses something else. So yeah. <clears throat> it changes from generation to generation too. And you've heard about people catfishing, uh, trying to convince people to get, send them all their money. It's called mm. catfishing. I'm thinking, where did that term come from? But I was going to put it on here. But there's a uh, one of those GIFs of a, a guy with a like a fishing pole and the cat's chasing it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's catfishing. Yeah, Marty, that's right. Because when I grew up, the word gay meant you're happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, I'm along the, the line with the, the language and stuff, it's might not really be but anyway just reminded me of daddy went out to i don't remember where it was somewhere overseas he went and had meetings and i know he's told the story so some of you probably heard it but he was sitting there preaching he had a translator and, and um people were laughing when they shouldn't be laughing uh. and he was just kept on going and some of them were serious but some people would be laughing at you know and he was like found out afterwards the guy had no idea what he was saying he did not know how to translate Ah. And um, so he was just going along. I have no idea what he said, but didn't well, yeah, he, like, he didn't think it was funny talking about, you know, the whatever didn't, serious didn't, one he was talking about. And they were laughing. Didn't somebody did that to one of our presidents in a foreign country? The guys are making all kinds of signs and and uh, he didn't know sign language. He was making stuff up as he went. <laughs> but it's like you said, Keith. Back when my mother was growing up, the term was uh, nutty as a fruitcake. When yeah. I was growing up, it was queer. And then, of course, now they have another term is the gay. And uh, like you said, when, when, back in mine in your day, it was talking about, you know, somebody happy and, and, and what have you. Uh, but uh, like I said, I was... <laughs> I went with some friends over to Taft one night and uh, one of the kids that was with us, his best friend was a black kid and we picked him up and took him with us. And uh, anyway, uh, he had always been friendly to me when we hadn't seen each other very often. But uh, anyway, I said, oh, you look like a dude because he was really you know, dressed up, really looked nice. Mm. And boy, he got cold. And all evening, he didn't have anything to do with me. So on the way, I decided they've got another meaning for that now that I don't know about. And so anyway, we got in the car to come back to Bakersfield. And I told him, I said, I don't know what it means to you, but I said, when I was growing up, dude met somebody who really looks nice. and So just like that, he was back his old self again. He never did tell me if it had a different meaning to them or not. So I don't know, but I know it sure changed him until I told him what it had meant to uh, me when, when my generation was growing up. I know a guy that calls everybody a dude. That's because he <laughs> don't know their names. <laughs> yeah, well, I know that a lot of people use that now. But anyway, when I used it to Nathan, uh, it made a difference in him. Okay, that was good. <clears throat> and um, I hope I didn't give you that next week. <laughs> it's gonna be Keith and Abel okay. next time. <clears throat> All right, we'll be ready. So, we will see you on Wednesday. Hopefully, nothing will be going on this time, so I'll be able to get on. But okay. Anyway, next you guys month. have a happy Sabbath. <laughs> I won't be on on Wednesday. I'm going on Sunday. My I'm going to my sister's, but I'll be on Sabbath. <laughs>